I've played a lot of PS1 games in my life, and there have been some good ones, and there have been some bad ones, and today we're going to talk about 10 more PS1 games you should avoid, unless you want to know what it's like to run in a lightning storm wearing a full suit of armor. It's not fun. Now these aren't the worst games on the PS1, in fact there are many that are worse. These are just 10 games that made me want to glue my eyelids shut so that I'd never have to see them again. Oh, by the way, I got a shot in my ass today, so I'm feeling like a million bucks, which is nice. Because yesterday, I was feeling like Chapter 13 Bankruptcy! <laughs> Alright, let's begin. <music> 007 Racing is a game that I expected to be a racing game. In fact, I thought it was going to be a racing game in the universe of James Bond. A franchise with legendary spy tales and gizmos and gadgets and basically anything that would have made this game playable. But no! Instead, we are isolated to a car, the whole time, doing missions like we were in a James Bond game. Imagine if you will, a driver of the game had an adopted brother, and that brother was exiled to the lowest pits of society where he festered, became a criminal, and came back as an adult and wanted to make a name for himself. That's what 007 Racing is, created by a company that free-based Bleach on a fairly regular basis, Zeppelin Games. They made such luxury games as Zybex, Ed the Duck, Tai Chi Tortoise, and Titanic Blinky. Then they went balls to the wall to create only racing games, only racing games, such as Pimp My Ride for the PS2 or Big Mother Truckers or Hummer Badlands or Le Mans 24 Hours. Yeah. This game is a joke in its existence, it actually pisses me off, because I've historically loved James Bond games, and the franchise has been exceptionally hit or miss. This is one of those outliers. There were times in video game history where bands wanted the opportunity to have games that were oddly specific to A, their brand, and B, their consumers. On the Sega CD alone, we have Make My Video with Marky Mark, Make My Video with NXS, and the same with Crisscross. Cross. Hell, even going back to the Atari, we had Journey Escape based on the album, but the Spice Girls, the Spice Girls, were the shit in the 90s. Me? Absolute crush on Emma Button, or shall I say, Baby Spice. Absolute 10, boys. Absolute 10. But this game, <laughs> it's nothing but a ton of gimmick bullshit where you dance to the songs that made them stand out, like Wannabe, Spice Up Your Life, Who Do You Think You Are, etc. You can dance a total of 10 different ways, and you'll be exposed to tons of bloopers and candid moments from the girls, and then you're done. Then you never play it again. Cool Borders! Okay, so this is a relatively newer one for me. I adored games like Twisted Edge Snowboarding, 1080. I even dabbled in this weird ESPN Winter X Games game for the PS2. So I was kind of excited to check out Cool Borders because I remember seeing it vividly growing up, but I never rented it. Then I played it courtesy of the conquest that I did on Idle Minds, and I was fucking disappointed. Now, Idle Minds didn't create this, but I did a parlay. Parlays for me are basically where I go back and I play previous games to catch up to the relevant title. So I had the luxury of dealing with UEP's bullshit for four straight games. We go down a slope, that's the easy part. The thing that really bones you is literally everything else. The physics in this game are unpredictable and frustrating, and sometimes it feels that you just gravitate towards objects, like you're on this vector path that you can't break free of, even if you're pushing the complete opposite direction. It just doesn't make any sense. And God forbid you go into a ravine because you'll ping pong off the walls, all the while being insulted by the announcer. There is no two player mode, so you can't even laugh about it with your friends. You just have to suffer through the whole thing. And what's so crazy is that to me, this franchise never really got better. I know some of you might love Cool Borders. I'm personally not a fan. This is another franchise I had the luxury of getting power fisted to, thanks to Idle Minds. Idle Minds made the engine that was used for Motocross Mania 2. If I recall, it was actually the engine used in Supercross Circuit, jointly created by 989 Studios and Idle Minds. And yet again, we had a parlay where I went back to check out earlier games in the franchise. Now, Motocross Mania is the perfect title for a game like this. We're strapped onto a dirt bike, we push X, 
and cowabunga it is. We go forward, indiscriminately slipping and sliding around while the computer does the exact same. One of the things that stands out to me as being annoying as hell is that when we're airborne, the camera locks onto the direction that we are looking. But if you move left or right, the bike pivots on this imaginary Z axis, meaning that if you know there's a hard left cut coming and you try to preemptively turn, you are gonna land horizontal and you will eat shit. The computer, fun fact, will likely do the same thing and then you have a 20 bike pileup that happens what seems like after every single turn. It's genuinely one of those games that are at the absolute bottom of the barrel. But strange enough, Motocross 2 is phenomenal. It actually ended up on a 10 games list for PlayStation 1, so props to Alpine Studio for unfucking what Diva Studios was so incapable of doing. This is a weird one. Do you like fighting games? I love fighting games. Do you like PowerPoints? But yeah, I, I like PowerPoints to get the job done. Do you like anime? Yeah, I'm all about weeb shit. Sign me up. What if we combined all three? Huh, <laughs> what? This is Evil Zone, and it's exactly that. This is a very early Yuke's game. They would knock it out of the park on the PS2 with Dragon Ball Z Budokai, and in some ways it reminds me of it, but when you play this, you'll notice a few things. Number one, instead of animated cutscenes, they make a PowerPoint of overcompressed images. Number two, the fights mostly consist of who can fire off their special moves first, and every single one has a movie that plays. It's not long, but it's about a 10 second move, so in some ways it feels like rock, paper, scissors to see who can fire off their special move first. I beat this in an hour, it's incredibly short. It's not hard at all either. Actually reminds me of Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what it feels like. A PowerPoint. Many of you know Acclaim, right? Acclaim was born from Activision, well, specifically Robert Holmes and Jim Skarposky. And if you like me, you know their games because they seem to always be shoved in our faces. And in some ways, it was sort of unavoidable. In the 80s and 90s, we had Ocean, LJN, and of course, Acclaim. Their business model involved making video games based on anything and everything that children loved. They even bought LJN in the early 90s. So Acclaim is pretty much patient zero for any game that makes you scrunch your face like, what, what am I doing with my life? But something I don't see many people cover is that Acclaim purchased Valiant Comics in 1994. Some of you might be like, uh, actually, there are no comics outside of Marvel, Dark Horse, and DC. And if you say they are, you're wrong. No, Valiant Comics 100% existed, and their claim to fame was bringing back legacy gold key comic characters, like a little Native American fuckboy named Turok. But why stop there? We have Armorines, Project Swarm, or Shadow Man, and a lesser known character, Exo Manowar. Exo Manowar is a literal Visigoth warrior from the Roman Empire that managed to snag a super suit known as the Exo Manowar armor. That's it. It's basically a low budget Iron Man, right? Which gives me an idea. Give me a second. Atari here. How can we get sued by you today? Hey Atari, it's a claim. How have you been doing? Eh, pretty good. Got some lawsuits to handle today. Hey, I noticed that you have the rights to Marvel game IPs, so I was wondering, do you want to whip out our dicks and slap them together and create a game after? Yeah, I, I could do that. that. That sounds like a great time. And the result was Iron Man and Exo Man of War in Heavy Metal. It's a HORRIBLE action game where we run around just shooting nonstop, which is fine until we get to a boss and realize it's almost impossible to dodge them. Every single aspect of this game is a depressive hit to the cerebellum. The controls are ass, the music is forced, and if you told me this was a hyperscan game, I would believe you. It's hard to explain. Pop it in an emulator for like three minutes and you'll know exactly how I feel. This game is actually interesting because it was supposed to be, ready for it, a Yoshi game. The developers of this game, Argonaut Software, had a promising relationship with Nintendo because they created the Super Effects chip, which was used in Star Fox. Now, Argonaut created this game because at the time, there were no Nintendo IPs that were 3D, at least in the platforming sense. So, they had this idea, and they called up Shigeru Miyamoto, 
and he said, oh, that's really cool, but check this out. We already making 3D Mario games, so we're going to pass. Okay, good job, though. Kisses. Which kind of pissed off Argonaut, and that business relationship broke off. But the meat and bones of the game was already created, and from that was developed Croc, if that makes sense. By the way, the 3D Mario game that he was talking about, Mario 64, figured that I'd finish the story. Now, Croc isn't inherently a bad game, at least on face value. It's just an asset dump platformer with two bad things, the controls and the camera. If you combine those two with slippery controls that just don't feel right and you have the recipe for a really rough platformer that could have been so much better. It's supremely better than Croc 2 though. That game is butthole. I could rehash my backstory for how I feel about JRPGs, but I think it's been said enough. Too long didn't read it, I didn't really play JRPGs as a kid, I was more of an action-adventure game kind of kid, right? And once I reached adulthood, I opened up my horizons to play more JRPGs. Now if you're curious about what my top 10 JRPGs that I've played to date are, there's actually a video about it. I know some folks mention it, so I figured why not pop it in here. It'll be in the description down below and at the end of the video. Now, Beyond the Beyond is essentially Golden Sun on the PlayStation 1, and about 5 trillion times more frustrating. I would rather start a fire by shoving a stick up my ass and spinning around fast, because that's how it feels playing this game. For some weird reason, Camelot Software Planning, yeah, the same folks who made Golden Sun, decided to completely rewrite how JRPGs handle health. If you look at the footage, you'll see VP and LP. What's that, you might ask? Well, VP is our vitality points, LP is our life points. We have up to 30 VP, and once that drains, we pass out for a turn, and we come back after giving up some LP to fill up our VP. Once our LP drains, we die. Cool! We also have some dope characters, too. Generic lady number one, generic dude number two, generic rich prince number one, and of course, big guy with a lesbian haircut. And guess what? He's cursed about 40% of the game, so he's just this massive glass cannon that doles out damage and then takes recoil and dies all the time. This story in this game is as shallow as the gene pool in Alabama, and literally nothing about this game is good. In fact, it's quite shit. And if there was ever an RPG, I would go out of my way to say not play, this one, you're looking at it. Rainbow Six is an awesome franchise. I've loved every single version of it that I've played, and I've personally played all the way up to Vegas too, and then I guess I kind of fell off from it. But Rainbow Six, as a franchise, stems from Tom Clancy's book, Rainbow Six, in 1998. And in the book, we hear about familiar faces like John Clark or Dean Chavez, right? And the success of that book led to a pretty sweet deal that would eventually unfold as the Rainbow Six franchise, one of many franchises that exist because of Tom Clancy's novels. Now, I played this game on the PC. I loved it. The team management aspect is insane. You can beat a stage in a few minutes because you're afforded the opportunity to plan out your attack, and you can initiate each team accordingly and execute a solid mission. But for whatever reason, they didn't put any of that in the PS1 version of the game. They yanked all the team management, the mission planning, literally everything. They yanked it out, threw it in file 13. So what we are left with is a severely crippled, and if you ask me, downright disrespectful representation of a solid game. Even the Nintendo 64 version did it better. Uh-oh, here's a hot take. So I historically don't like the Siphon Filter franchise, and I feel that the reason I don't like it might not be justifiable to the masses, but guess what? I don't care. Hit detection, extremely aware AI, bad draw distance, and a camera that sabotages you. Now, Siphon Filter is a long-standing franchise. It stems from Eodetic, or what would eventually become Sony Bend Studio. And we play as Gabriel Logan, who is going to try to find an international bio madman who has this nanovirus known as the Siphon Filter, which is a bioweapon that can target specific people. Think of it as a DNA, RNA level, molecular level of genocide if it's in the wrong hands. Now, Gabe himself, he controls wonderfully. I was actually really impressed, but the rest of the game is a stupid. 
You can be point blank shooting somebody and the gun will miss every single time, and the developers force you to get really efficient at landing headshots. You have tank controls, you have pop-up mission elements that you can fail at any time, you have absolutely no idea where to go, and the AI can see much farther than you can. They're like walking binoculars with guns, which between me and you, it was designed by John Garvin, and he, <laughs> he can see into your soul. Nothing escapes John! Even the people who took this picture crossed the event horizon of his eyes. <laughs> oh, my head hurts. I promise I'm a professional. <laughs> Fuck me. Now, this game isn't bad. I mean, it was universally acclaimed for a reason, but just for the life of me, I, I don't like it. It does kind of get better as time goes on, but the whole hit scanning, wall hacking, bugs and shit, that's not for me. No, thank you. And that's it for today's list. What did you think about it? Are there any games on this list that you've played? And if so, what are your opinions on them? I'd love to hear down below in the comment section. I do read and respond to every single comment, even the mean ones. By the way, if you made it to the end of this episode, you're already home with our community. We're a group of video game enthusiasts who love remembering a time when life was just a little bit easier to live. And if that's something you vibe with, feel free to join. Finally, the single most important thing you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the videos and the projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes. Fortifier out. <laughs>